Early Greek philosophers, the pre-Socratics, History and Systems, Dr. Michael Botwin, Department of Psychology, California State University, Fresno. In this unit, we're going to be taught, discussing some of the first Greek philosophers. Now, these men were rich upper class guys. They also were the first to start thinking about our place in the cosmos, at least in Western Europe. Now, there have been advanced civilizations in other places like Egypt, China, India, and in the Mideast, but we generally start the history classes with the Greeks. Can't do everything in one semester. So, here we go. Taylor's one of my favorite guys because he sets the ball rolling. Thales is the first philosopher of record in the Western world. That means right now Greece. Although I'm sure there were philosophers in other places that he traveled and learned from. Now, it was rare for people to travel in Thales' day, but he made it all the way to Egypt and Babylonia. And there seems to be some evidence to that case. He learned a great deal on his travels and brought it back to Greece and incorporated those ideas into his theory. Now, Thales comes up with the notion of studying the cosmos or a cosmology. Now, his cosmology is based on observing nature. And remember, we talked about technology in the previous video. Pretty much nature was it then. There wasn't technology to depend on by any means. Uh, nature was it. And Thales had the view that the universe consists of natural substances and it's ordered by laws of nature, and it's not subject to the whims of the gods. So this is critically important because up to that point, many Greeks would say if something bad happened, well, God didn't like this, or if something good happened, the gods favored you. And many of the city-states had gods that were their god. And if you look at that, Athenia, Athens, naturally. And so they would pray to the gods to give them good outcomes. Thales was one of the first people to try to pull superstition out of his ideas, which are eventually going to be some of the first scientific ideas out there. Now, Thales is really the first physicist. And Thales had a quest. His quest was to find the physis. The physis is the primary material of the universe. And this is still the quest of physicists today. They keep on call, finding smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. We went from finding atoms to be able to split atoms, and then we were able to look at subatomic particles. And now some people are looking at string theory and other ways of looking at the universe. So finding the stuff of the universe is a quest that is still out there. And if you ever watched the Big Bang Show, well, that was a comedy version of the quest to find the basic stuff of the universe. Now, Thales looked around his world, and remember, pretty much the only instruments he had were his five senses. Didn't have any advanced scientific equipment. 
So Thales tried to find the physis, his primary thing, and he believed that the water was the physis. Now, you might want to disagree with him, and I think a lot of people now with modern science would disagree with him, but if you're talking hundreds of years B.C., water is not a bad guess. Many things in the universe consist of water or are partially water, including us. I remember watching one scientific show where the aliens referred to us as sacks of water. Uh, water is necessary for living things. You can't have life without water. Uh, we can take the water out of things and reconstitute it with new water. If you've ever tried freeze-dried stuff or dehydrated stuff, you know that we can remove the water. And if you remove the water from many foods, you get pretty much nothing left. And if you've ever eaten freeze-dried camping meals, you know that taste is pretty much one of those things that goes when you take the water away. But water exists, and this goes back to your third, third grade, excuse me, science class, because water exists in many forms. And this is one of the things that Thales was interested in. Water could exist as ice. Water could exist as steam, hail, snow, clouds, fog. In other words, water very easily can be seen observing, you know, being, yeah, being part of all three states of matter, a liquid, a solid, and a gas. Now, Thales made many mathematical contributions and developed many geometric theorems. Now, some people believe he derived this knowledge from his travels, especially to Egypt and those areas. But he was able to use geometry to make some interesting calculations and use things for navigation, figuring out distance, and all kinds of things like that. Thales is considered by many the first scientist of record. That's very important, at least to me, and since it is to me, it should be to you. Uh, for exams and things like that, hint, hint, say no more, say no more. Now, Thales knowledge permitted him to do some interesting things. He was able to develop some rudimentary methods of navigation in terms of studying the stars and astronomy. He was able to predict eclipses and he used applied geometry. In fact, there's an old story about Thales using his powers of deduction. He was able to figure out that there was going to be a bumper crop of olives that year in the area of Greece that he lived in. And olives and olive oil, a major Greek commodity to this day. So what Thales did was bought up all the time on the olive presses when he estimated the harvest was in. And he made quite a bit of money doing that. So at least he wasn't a poor philosopher. Now the other thing that I think is critical in understanding Thales and appreciating him is that he offered his theories only as speculation. They were open to criticism. He said, if I screwed up, tell me where I'm wrong and let's fix it. He invited his students to be critical of his teachings. And many individuals see this as the foreshadowing of the scientific method, that all knowledge is subject to change based on new information. 
one of Taylor's students was Aximander, who also pursued the idea of the physis. And to him, the physis was even more fundamental than water. He didn't quite have the words for it or the ideas for it, but he believed the physis was something that had the capacity of becoming anything. In other words, kind of a theory we have today about how molecules can be arranged and rearranged to create pretty any, much any substance. He did have kind of a weird view of the universe. He believed the stars were fixed on a crystalline sphere that rotated around the Earth. He believed the Earth was cylindrical. That's kind of a halfway point between the flat Earthers and the round Earthers. And he even gave it dimensions. He believed that the diameter of the Earth was three times its height. And as many early philosophers and cosmologists believed, the Earth is the center of the universe. He came up with an odd process for uh, believing about how the cosmos works. He thought that the universe was mechanical and light objects were flung out into the periphery by the vortex movement of the planet and the stars. He also came up with a notion that's going to be with us all the way until we get to modern times in the history of our field. The notion that everything comes in opposites. So to understand hot, you have to understand cold. To understand moist, you have to understand dry. To understand earth, you have to be able to differentiate from ether or air. He came up with an early theory of evolution that's not worth our time discussing. And he also imported ideas from the East, as his mentor Thales did, and included the sundial in those contributions to Greek science. Bottom line on Examander, he asked about reality. And this is again going to be an ongoing theme throughout our semester. And he asked questions that we're going to struggle answering. Can we trust our senses? Is logic and reason always right? And can we reconcile differences between reason, what we think, and perception? what we see. Now we live in a world where trusting our senses is becoming more and more important and people are trying to fool us in terms of our sensations and our experiences. The food industry spends millions and millions of dollars developing artificial flavors developing artificial taste, simulating the taste of things that we're tuned in to finding very delicious. And what happens is if you go to fast food place, typically what's happened is the chief beef used in many of these chains actually has been augmented with some chemical substances. So it tastes like you're eating premium hamburger. Think about that one. Try to reconcile what you know you're eating and what it tastes like. So these are important questions that we need to think about. In fact, we'll think about it and talk about them for quite a while. Heraclitus is another one of those guys 
I find really fascinating. Because Heraclitus is one of the first individuals to state, how can we know things if they're always changing? it makes it an interesting philosophical debate. If things are always changing, what can we know about something and what it's going to be in the future, what it was really like in the past? And change is an important part of life. Without change, life would be kind of boring and static, right? Heraclitus' main philosophical statement that you want to remember and I've uh, kind of put the little uh, sick there because it's uh, masculine but it really means humans and Heraclitus says no man steps into the same river twice now if you think about that that's pretty profound do we really ever step into the same river twice. Well, let's say that you go up and we're lucky enough to live in Fresno where we have easy access to the mountains. And there's some really great and dramatic rivers and streams up in the mountains that flow from the peaks down through whenever they get uh, used up by people. So let's say that you're at one of the scenic spots. It's, we're about an hour and a half away from Yosemite. And many people like to play in the rivers, walk across the rivers. Really isn't a great thing to do because it's not really safe because the current's really, really rapid. And depending on how high the water is, it can be deadly dangerous. But let's say we're looking at something later in the year waters kind of trickle down through the summer and you can actually walk through a stream so you trudge through the stream to the other side then you wave to your friends and you walk back well think about all the things that are different when you make your journey back across the little river or stream are you stepping through the same water that you started with? Is the stream bed, river bed, the same as it was before you disturbed it by walking across the first time? Has anything else changed? Has a fish moved downstream? Has a frog moved in? So Heraclitus makes this point about the river, but it applies to many things in life everything is subject to change. He says nothing ever is in the world. And he says everything in the world is in a state of becoming, changing into something else. This is his differentiation between becoming versus being. Being is just as you are. Becoming is changing into something else. So as a student, you're becoming something else. You're learning new information. You're processing things. You're learning how to think, the most important thing for a student to do. So you're changing, you're getting new knowledge, and you're becoming a scholar, and maybe if you're gonna to go to graduate school, a professional, a psychologist, uh, whatever, but you're becoming something due to the influence of going to college. Even your friends that didn't go to college, that just graduated high school, have started jobs, have started some kind of career path, hopefully, and they're not the same as they were in high school either. So we're constantly in a world where things are becoming rather than being. 
according to Heraclitus. Now, Heraclitus also has a physis, but he has a rather different physis. Since he's the change guy, his physis is fire. Fire is the thing that transforms other substances. So, if you're going to make lunch and you're going to boil some water and maybe make some pasta, you're taking the water, you're heating it, you're changing it with fire or heat. And some of that water, once it starts boiling, turns into steam. If we go to get a cool drink to go with our lunch and we go to the refrigerator, we might grab some ice, that's solid water. But if we take ice and throw it in our drink, within a few minutes, that ice is going to start melting and becoming back to its liquid state. So fire changes things. Now eventually fire becomes associated with other things, like reasoning ability. So here is the official seal of California State University, Fresno. Some individuals may think it's the bulldog. It's not. This is our seal. Notice there's a little Aladdin's lamp above our little Latin saying in a book. It's a symbol used in many academic places, and it's the lamp of knowledge. Very common to see it. I could show you tons of these things. I won't. Here is the seal of the University of Michigan, which is my alma mater. And you see sitting on top of a book, a little Aladdin's lamp. Also the light of learning. And you see the sun behind it, a little bit more light. But again, not the Block M or the Wolverine. This is the official seal of the University of Michigan. My last little symbol to show you is the seal of the University of Hawaii. And they don't mess around with any wimpy little lamps of learning. They go for the big torch right there. I find that extremely amusing. Now Heraclitus had other ideas. He again brings up the idea we just talked about with Eximander, the idea of the theory of opposites, and the idea that all things exist between polar opposites. Now, is there anything that's unchangeable? This line of thinking is going to become profoundly important as we go through philosophy. What is unchangeable knowledge? Because everything in the world is changing, but is there anything we can really know? Well, according to Heraclitus, the only unchangeable knowledge is abstract but real. And he talks about two sets of these, mathematical ideas and mental ideas or spiritual ideas. You can imagine perfection, even though if you may never be able to obtain it. I try to obtain it in my PowerPoints, and you've seen I really miss the boat on many of them. But ideas of mathematics are always real, even though there's an abstract connotation. The old little uh, mathematical buzzwords. 2 plus 2 equals 4. 2 plus 2 will always equal 4. It's abstract. It's knowable. But it's real. 2 plus 2 is 4. Now you might have two freshmen and two sophomores. There are still four students. You wait a little while, you add them up again. 
maybe now they're juniors and seniors. So you take two juniors and two seniors and there's still four students. Four is always changeable even if the four objects are changeable. So if I take four ice cubes, set them out, they're still going to be two plus two ice cubes, but they will change and that will melt and they'll eventually become one puddle of water. But that's a little bit of different logic. So mental ideas, ideas about perfection, ideas that are otherwise abstract, or ideas about the spirit are in that same category for Heraclitus. Now Heraclitus comes around and says, sensory information is subject to change and hence not reliable. How we perceive things may change. How we feel about things may change. Our taste may change. Something that tastes good on one day may not taste good on another. So sensory information is, according to Heraclitus, fundamentally unreliable. Right now, I'm sitting and talking to you, uh, and my sensory processes have changed over the years. I've got two small pieces of plastic, little plastic discs sitting on my eyes. They are contacts. If I didn't have these contacts, I really would not be able to see much further than seven or eight feet. Everything would be a massive blur. I've taken them out for the evening, but I've also gotten to the point of being an old fart where I wear hearing aids. And my hearing has changed over the span of my lifetime and I've lost some of my ability to hear, especially in the higher frequencies. So I especially have problems hearing women's voices or anything higher up. Probably from listening to too much hardcore rock and roll music when I was young. I was a big fan of classic rock, which was not classic then. Bands like Zeppelin, I still listen to The Who virtually every week. I've got a mix CD and a playlist on my computer. Uh, so I listen to those guys, and I still listen to it very loud. And I paid the price. And frankly, I think it was a good price to pay, because otherwise I would have had to listen to easy listening music. And I don't think that's any way for anyone to live. That's my editorial comment for this lecture. I want to very briefly talk about Parmendes and Zeno. Uh, don't worry too much about them for the exam. They say that reality is finite, uniform, motionless, and fixed. And any change is really an illusion. Zeno came up with the notion of movement that's called Zeno's paradox. If you move all the way from one point to another, you can always split that in half. And then in turn, you can split it in half again and continue doing that ad infinitum. So at any movement, any point in time there is no change. Kind of a weird idea. That's why I don't worry about it too much. The Greeks were attempting to figure out the universe, whether it was through religion or as our first group of philosophers noted the study of the cosmos. They've got a limited amount of technology to do it, 
but in some remarkable ways they're hitting the nail right on the head. So as we move on, we'll see their views get more sophisticated. But we've got the ball rolling. This has been a We Have Couches video production, copyright 2020, Professor Michael Botwin, all rights reserved.